So welcome to the podcast, episode 54. Thank you for joining us. I want to talk a little bit today about essential oils. Now, this is, um, this is a subject that is not worth our attention at all, um, depending on how you um, think about it. And if you think about it another way, it's something that a pastor, all pastors ought to be concerned about. So um, uh, it, it is not any pastor's um, business what, uh, what brand of shampoo or what brand of shoe polish uh, his parishioners use. So if we're applying a Christian worldview uh, analysis to everything, uh, you don't get to go into your parishioners' lives and say, because I'm a Christian worldview thinker, I get to tell you that you have to buy a Ford and not a Toyota, for example. Um, so if we're simply talking about uh, a product that someone has heard about and they tried and they like it for some reason, and the reason is um, just day-to-day cause and effect, uh, I've I, rub down my coffee table with this and I like the way it makes it shine. Uh, that sort of thing is, um, I mean, talk about adiaphora. That's just uh, nobody's, it's nobody's business uh, to go into somebody else's life and say, hey, you shouldn't be using that product. So what could be, why, why don't we just put essential oils um, in that category? Why don't we um, why don't we just say, hey, live and let live? Well, here the, the reason is there, there are a couple of, um, uh, couple of reasons. Uh, there may be, you, if you have a, uh, you can have a product and a product problem, or you can have a marketing and a marketing problem. So uh, with multi-level uh, marketing companies, the product may be fine. As I understand it, many Amway products are just fine. The soap cleans and the detergent washes and that sort of thing. Uh, But you can have a problem in relationships if uh, everybody that uh, an Amway um, rep knows becomes a mark or a target. So so the issue there is how something is uh, how something is marketed, not not the product itself. But of course, you'd have the same product uh, problem if um, some grocer, uh, whenever he saw somebody uh, walking by his store, grabbed a box of Tide and ran out and tackled the guy and tried to sell him the Tide. The problem is not the product. The problem is the way the product is being marketed. And I would say multi-level marketing um, invites that kind of abuse. You want to you, you be very careful. If you're involved in it, you want to be very, very careful on that level. But the, the real thing, the real issue that I want to talk about here with uh, essential oils is uh, it, it appears to me that it has gone beyond um, uh, a product being uh, marketed to do what various products do. You know, if someone marketed um, essential oils by saying, this particular oil uh, makes things oily, makes things slippery, or this particular oil is great for, um, you know, for, well, I don't know, um, the sort of things you use uh, oil for, like baby oil, uh, you know, rubbing down your baby. Um, yeah, that's, that's one thing. But uh, essential oils, it appears to me to have gone um, well beyond this, and in the, uh, in the modern parlance has, uh, in my view, has officially jumped the shark. That um, Now, I could see doing something like this. If you sold somebody an oil that says, uh, um, this oil, buying this oil will help you make uh, good financial decisions, and you get home and you open the box and you read the little flyer, and the flyer says, the first thing you should learn is never buy product, is to never buy products like this one. All right, All right that would be... Uh, that would be a good lesson in making sound financial decisions. But it, it, it appears to me that there is no conceivable relationship between application of a particular kind of oil and uh, making sound financial decisions. Oil on your skin or oil applied in this way or oil applied in that way, 
makes you good at math or makes you are you are you serious um, and it gets even that, that's a somewhat silly example but it gets even more uh, challenging when you have uh, oil of forgiveness when when something when certain things are marketed that begin to compete directly with what is offered to us through Christ in the gospel then what you have is a marketing cult it's not it, you you can't sell forgiveness now if um, i'd be if someone said well, no we really do have forgiveness oil or we really do have oil that helps with forgiveness uh, my my uh, first question is so why are you selling it why why are you not giving it away the grace of god is free f- f- um open-handed forgiveness. The grace of God in Christ is simply sheer gift. And when someone has uh, uh, bought into a system uh, and they've bought into the network of friendship and the koinonia of all the, the people who have the shared, same sh- shared assumptions, you get, um, you get to the point where uh, you can you you um, you've stepped into what Peter Berger called a plausibility structure. Your everybody you know reinforces what you think you know, and so um, if no one ever contradicts you, no one says how can oil how can how can oil bring forgiveness? How can oil bring financial savvy? Um, th- that's just uh, crazy. If you, if you are inside that plausibility structure the entire time, if you, if you never hear, uh, I mean really hear, dissenting voices, then what you're going to do, what you're going to wind up uh, doing is finding yourself in this um, world where no fact can be allowed to contradict. You every, and, and you have... Um, and you basically you've established an orthodoxy and an, uh, and uh, um, a system a rigid orthodoxy that will reject out of hand anything that contradicts this particular thoughtless, mindless orthodoxy, and you just run it out. Suppose someone was really into essential oils, and you said, well, if you buy this bottle, it will make you a really really good reformed Baptist. Or if you buy uh, this oil, it will help you understand Trinitarian theology. All you have to do is keep amping the, um, the claims for it up. And inside the plausibility structure, uh, there's no one to say no. Um, but Paul says in Corinthians, uh, those who compare themselves with themselves are not wise. When you don't allow ob- objective cross-checks, when you don't allow... Um, someone to falsify what you're claiming, if, if that's simply out of court from the, from the beginning, then you're never really going to learn anything. So, podcast episode 54. Uh, again, great to have you with you. <laughs> again, great to have you with me. It's good to have you here. Thanks. Um, so I want to, uh, my book review uh, this time around is um, The Genius of Birds by uh, Jennifer Ackerman. Uh, the Genius of Birds. This was a New York Times uh, bestseller. Um, uh, my brother, Gordon, who teaches science at New St. Andrews, I, I, saw, uh, I saw him reading it. He recommended it. Um, and uh, it, it, it really is worth, uh, worthwhile. Uh, you, you learn. You begin by learning that the uh, insult bird brain is a a particularly inept uh, uh, insult. Uh, birds are amazing. Uh, now, not every bird is equally amazing, and and they've got IQ tests. You know, put quotation marks, scare quotes around IQ tests. But they've got tests that measure a bird's. Uh, rationality, their ability to figure out puzzles and and uh, and manufacture tools and do that sort of thing. Uh, the smartest bird appears to be uh, a, a kind of crow in um, uh, in New Guinea. Uh, but for for the prowess that these birds, the mental prowess that these birds exhibit, um, you can say, oh, well, what do you mean? Well, like. Um, 
the birds who uh, can hide over many, many square miles, tens of thousands of seeds, and remember where they put them. You know, they can, they can tuck seeds in multiple caches in multiple places, uh, tens, tens of thousands of places, and remember where they put them over the course of months. You know, that would be an, that would be an example. Um, being able to f- uh, figure out how to make a tool to uh, reach a piece of food, you know, that's in a tube or, you know, that, that sort of thing. They, they, they can figure things out. There are, um, and, and even uh, uh, little, uh, oh, I forget if they're sparrows or swallows. It's some uh, little brown job of that, uh, of that nature. Um, that uh, they can figure out, they fig- figured out how to uh, operate the electric eye in automatic doors. So, um, you know, a double door, a, a double door into a cafeteria area where the bird flies slowly in front of the sensor, opens the door, flies in, and uh, and can uh, get some food and then fly out again. He can learn. Basically, birds can learn how to operate the machinery. Uh, this is a fascinating book. If you want uh, uh, amazing levels of details on uh, what birds can, uh, what birds can do, this really is a book uh, for you. The one thing I, I, I'll mention this uh, as a uh, stumbling point. Well, it's not really a stumbling point because it's. I think it's good for Christians to hear this sort of thing. Um, Ackerman does a, a marvelous job assembling all this information about what birds can do. And she goes through uh, many, many different kinds of species of bird and details the amazing feats, the amazing mental feats that these birds can accomplish. And, and as she does so, she keeps talking about it in evolutionary terms. She won't leave the topic of evolution alone. So she's not just trying to tell us how smart birds are. She's also trying to tell us how they got that smart, and she's trying to attribute it all to natural uh, selection. She's trying to um, have this blind mechanistic, uh, this blind mechanistic process, accomplish these amazing things. And uh, but the one thing that's good about this book is that it it leaves you um, with the awareness that you can't just say. Um, oh, birds do what they do by instinct. That kind of hand-waving doesn't cut it. To say that birds do what they do by instinct uh, is to say that we don't know how or why birds do what they do. Uh, If you want to be flummoxed, if you want to be amazed, if you want to be gobsmacked, uh, The Genius of Birds is a a great uh, great go-to book for that. So continuing with uh, Podcast 54... We come to our hermartiology section, and the and as it happens, we're going through the New Testament, looking at all the Greek words for various sins, and uh, we've been spending some weeks on the word for sin itself. Uh, hamartia is the word for sin, the noun, and hamartano is the is the verb. The word hamartia is used twice, and we're taking a number of weeks to do this because the word comes up so often in the New Testament. The word hamartia is used twice in the letters to the Thessalonians. The first use has to do with a particular Jewish sin, and the second with a characteristic Gentile sin. First, for ye brethren became followers of the churches of God, which which in Judea are in Christ Jesus. For ye also have suffered like things of your own countrymen, even as they have of the Jews, who both killed the Lord Jesus and their own prophets, and have persecuted us, and they please not God, and are contrary to all men, forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles that they might be saved, to fill up their sins always. There, there it is, to fill up their sins always, for the wrath is come upon them to the uttermost. That's First Thessalonians 2, 14 through 16. Paul is here describing his countrymen as being, quote unquote, contrary to all men with the result that they were filling their cup up to the brim with their own sins, all right? So uh, being, having that attitude, that kind of attitude toward all men, uh, meant that they were filling, filling their bucket with uh, their own sins. The wrath of God 
evidenced in the destruction of their entire religious apparatus in 70 AD, was going to be upon them shortly, just within a few years. So that, that's the characteristic um, uh, Jewish sin, at least the characteristic Jewish sin of the first century. Uh, the, the Jews had been um, priding themselves, pluming themselves on their descent from Abraham, and they were better than, uh, since the return from the exile to Babylon, they'd been relatively idolatry-free uh, compared to the way they'd been before when they were, uh, when the characteristic Jewish sin was to become just like their neighbors, to bow down to all the idols, to, to, to adopt the idolatry of the surrounding nations. After the uh, exile in Babylon and after they came back uh, with a little bit of a bumpy start in the time of Nehemiah and Ezra, uh, they, they remained generally idolatry-free if you're talking about the idol, uh, idols that have physical statues in physical temples that you leave baskets of fruit in front of. Uh, but then, they, because they were separated from uh, the Gentile world, the pagan world in that way, they became proud of their distinctiveness. And becoming proud of their distinctiveness, their idolatry-free distinctiveness, they made an idol out of it. Uh, their pride fashioned an idol out of their distinctiveness from the Gentile world. And so they were contrary to all men, and so they filled up the cup, their cup of sin, uh, their, their cup of sin uh, to the brim. So this doesn't let the Gentiles uh, uh, off. A characteristic Gentile sin was also part of this catastrophe in the first century. Uh, Paul says this in 2 Thessalonians 2, 3, and 4. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin shall be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth, exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, or that, or that he is God, or that he is God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Um, so the problem was the, the Jews wanted to be a dog in the manger, getting in between God and all men. The Gentiles wanted to be God, as evidenced in the hubris of the Roman emperors. And of course, both of them were the epitome of sin. The Jews who wanted to get in between God and the Gentile nations, and the Gentile nations who wanted to be uh, lords walking upon the earth as they were represented and represented well in their... Um, very conceited and proud uh, Roman emperors. God in the time of the sickness, God in the doctor too. You've spent a pleasant half hour with podcast proprietor Douglas Wilson. This podcast is produced by Canon Press. Please take a moment to subscribe to the podcast on your favorite listening platform. To hear more from Doug, please visit canonpress.com.